Okay. Everybody hear this okay? This is a bit, a bit of a departure from your typical uh, DrupalCon presentation fair, but I hope it's okay. Welcome to API Design, the musical. No, really, got the guitar here. We will be doing a musical session. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of times uh, DrupalCon sessions are named pretty creatively. I think we all enjoy having a bit of uh, fun with those, but, uh, but this is truth in advertising. So uh, we're going to learn about... Uh, how to make your API, API designs uh, successful. We're going to celebrate the storied career of one of Rock's most enigmatic groups, API Design, who took Prog Rock one step further and made it Programming Rock. <laughs> I'm David Deers. I'm from Four Kitchens. We're in Austin, Texas. We make big websites. Um, I've been working with Four Kitchens for nearly four years now and doing Drupal as my full-time development job for a bit more than that. And before that, uh, Cold Fusion. So any Cold Fusion guys out there? Anybody? Oh, uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm, seriously, it was terrible. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> no offense. Ben Fortner, we love you. All right. Um, I do have a special interest in databases and uh, database schema design, uh, and that's uh, parlayed into um, a sort of a love of uh, making APIs and um, understanding what those are. My recent work has been um, for media companies doing API design and implementing APIs uh, with RESTful, with Drupal, um, and something I really quite enjoy. I thought what I would do um, is uh, pay tribute to that great band, API Design, who tackled these kinds of issues in uh, song and words, uh, but also try to give you a little background on each of those songs uh, before we get too far into it. Uh, I have a double life. Uh, not only am I a uh, Drupal developer by day, I'm a classically trained composer. I got my master's from the University of Texas at Austin. I studied with Kevin Putz, who was a Pulitzer Prize winner in 2012, I believe, or 2011. Uh, and I've also studied with Steven Slawak, who's a master sitar player. He's a disciple of Ravi Shankar. Very lucky to study with him for 11 years. Um, so, and just in case you're looking for something musical to do tonight, I'm playing at Kulik's Woodshed at 8 p.m. in North Hollywood. Okay. That's a live taping. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so, first of all, and uh, feel free to call these out. Does anybody know any companies out there who offer a web API? Just feel free to shout those out. Yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Yes. 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 <laughs> That's just off the top of our head. So we can kind of tell that, you know, if we just even put our minds to it, we'd come up with a, a million of these. But uh, it, is, it is a brainstorming session just like this that the band API Design wrote their very first hit. Uh, these are some of the APIs that I know from the very first album, The Man in 00000. zero, 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 zero. Google Maps, Twilio, YouTube, Wikipedia, Who is Facebook, Apple Store, MDB, PlaySkin, Spotify, Netflix, World of Warcraft, FDA, Census Bureau, Ed Sheeran, Dictionary, Travis, Sun, Song, Dick, Vimeo. These are just a few of the APIs I know. All of these companies have so much functionality to supply. All of these companies have got their own newfangled web API. Pinterest, Square Cash, AOL, Bitcoin, Animetrics, British Airways, Ubi Dots, GitHub, Soho, Salesforce, Jimmy Fowl, BMN, SNL, eBay, Wolfram, Mountain, Happy Aries, Azure, New York Times, Zillow, these are just a few of the APIs I know. Why, it almost seems that every company out there has an API. Some are good. Some aren't so good. I guess it depends on... How well they were designed. QuickBooks, O'Reilly Labs, Rumblefish, LinkedIn, Redis, SoundCloud, NPR, Eventbrite, MailChimp, UPS, TED Talks, Suspensify, Hooli, Pied Piper, okay, those don't exist. BioWare, Groupon, Dropbox, Shutter Pro, these are just a few of the APIs I know. These are just a few of the APIs I know. Thank you very much. Of course, that was a huge hit for them way back in the 70s. Um, no, that's not true. Um, 
So with, uh, with web APIs, uh, basically, these folks are servicing the value of their businesses and their backends and their platforms by producing an interface to the functionality and making that available on the web. That's what a web API is. All these companies have chosen to do that. It's a part or all of their business value. So this is a huge thing. Um, just from this list alone, just from that, from that simple song, um, it's, and it's in no way complete. There's a ton more APIs out there. We can see that there's been a proliferation of web APIs, and that's been great. And not great. Because right now, in the world of web APIs and web API design, we're kind of in the space that uh, PHP applications doing CMS work were before Drupal and before WordPress. That's the wild west of API design. So um, they're wildly different in, in design and implementation details. They're all over the place. And uh, you kind of have to code to each one. So um, can't have a lot of reusability in your code. And it's kind of a nightmare. And the patterns of use are kind of um, not yet risen to the fore. So we hope to change that through um, education efforts like this one to kind of get people on board with a new way to think about web APIs, a more reusable way. Um, so there is hope. Just like PHP web applications began to discover useful and reusable patterns like Drupal and uh, the way that we work with CMSs uh, in WordPress and Drupal. Um, so we codify that approach, and we can do that in API design. So. It's the Wild West, but the Wild West was tamed. So how was the Wild West one? Well, just like cultivating uniform approaches and best practices in PHP, if we do the same thing with API design, we can create strong standards that are going to allow us the same ability and freedom that we had when we made that remarkable step in PHP to innovate and iterate on those designs with tremendous fury. And that's the best possible world for API design and for web APIs, because all of these disparate APIs can then act in concert and allow us to begin to innovate not only in isolation, but in a shared community like we have here. So we have DrupalCon, which is an amazing event. I love this thing. It's why I got into Drupal development in the first place. It's why I wanted to work for Four Kitchens. And I've been doing that for the past four years, and I really love it. I'm so happy about it. I hope you're having a good DrupalCon LA experience. If this is your fir anybody's first DrupalCon out there, all right, yeah. All right. Put your hands together for those guys. Listen. Welcome to the community. Thanks for coming. So um, when we talk about web APIs, um, how can we tell you know, if it's designed well? What are the dangers of having a poorly designed API? And, and really, when we do talk about web APIs, what exactly are we, are, are we talking about? So this is, of course, the interface pattern from the Fowler book. Uh, so not to get too geeky, but, we, but uh, that, that's, in fact, what it is. We're providing a way to uh, abstract and present uh, a, a backend that we don't wish to expose our implementing methods, our, our implementation, and we want to give people the ability to have that functionality through much simpler interface. And so in order to really be successful with web APIs, you need people to use them. And part of that's going to come from the value of the backend systems that you're exposing through your API. But um, it might not, you might have a competitor or two. And if you do, and even if you don't, good API design can be a differentiator in your space. So if it's a well-designed API and developers like using it and enjoy using it, they're going to do original things with the functionality that you've exposed, extending your business value way beyond you know, what you might have originally thought. You might not even have those ideas, but uh, by developing a well-designed API, people are taking that and extending that and doing wonderful things and combining it with other APIs, making mashups and other uh, powerful technologies. So, why, but why design it all? You know, we're, we're, we're a natural shop. Uh, we iterate on stuff. Why not do that with an API? That, that seems like a good idea, right? Well, no, not, not really. Uh, it's, it's kind of bad because, unfortunately, with APIs, you, you sort of have a silent contract when you release your first public version of that API with um, folks who want to implement clients against it, whoever they might be. And that contract begins, and they begin to expect things from you, from your API. This is how your API is going to go. This is how we're going to use it. This is what you're going to provide. And that's going to be there forever, right? You never would want to change that. So I'm just going to implement my client, and we're going to be good. And it'll work for the next 15 years. That's how technology works, right? <laughs> right? No. That's not right. So you might, they, there might only be one implementation on your API, and they may never come back. Um, so make it a good one. Make, spend time on your web API design. Make sure that it's useful. And there's some ways to kind of do that. And uh, when, we, when we think about you know, what makes a web API design good, what are the, what are the properties of a well-designed API? Well, the fast answer is, is it easy to use? <laughs> uh, 
when clients implement your API, does that generally make sense when you take a look at it from a distance? Does your API think of a computer as just another kind of user? Is it robust and is it extensible? So that's a fast answer. The long answer, the magic fortune cookie answer, is sort of you'll know it when you see it, and we're going to teach you how to see it. And these are exactly the kinds of questions and answers that the Band API design sought to answer in their ballad of the Web API from bringing it all 127.0.0.1. Application programming in a phase Like that old pattern from the file book Used to hide the complexity of your code away It decouples your code from your functionality And opens up your systems to a host of external originality There are internal APIs And ones that have a public face but They all expose some back-end functionality In simpler ways World Wide Web Is one of technology's greatest hits And it could do a lot worse then modeling your API on it. And it's true, each public API is a silent contract. You're telling every API developer and client just what they should expect. If your code couples to your back end, then the problems will be hard to amend. It's easier to add than rescind And legacy support seems to never end You've got one chance for a good version one So why don't you take your time Put your efforts into a good API design World Wide Web is one of technology's greatest hits and you could do a lot worse than modeling your API on it. What indicates a good API design? Does it think of computers as users and keep the architecture of the web in mind? Is it easy to use? Is it robust and extendable too? Does it have client code that is easily understood? If you've got a web API Wouldn't you want it to know where it comes from And to behave as such in kind? And modeling your API on it. Thank you very much. That was their, their, their Greenwich Village phase, of course. Um, and, and what better way to sort of keep the architecture of the web in mind than making your API a RESTful API? And uh, we're going to talk about what REST means, what a RESTful API really is um, right now. And, uh, you know, uh, the band tackled that issue in their 80-minute double album odyssey, RESTful Gata De Vida, uh, which is a huge concept album, which uh, is the entirety of Fielding's dissertation on REST. Uh, which I'm not going to perform for you tonight. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, if you can see me later, we, we'll, we'll have a beer about that. Um, but who is Fielding? Who is the guy who sort of went through this whole uh, dissertation? Well, he's a very important gentleman because he wrote the RFCs for HTTP 1.0 and 1.1. So he knows a few things about the web. And the web had been around when he kind of put this to pen, uh, put this to, I guess, 
computer keyboard. Uh, we're past the time of pens back in the World Wide Web, the early days. Anyway, um, and for his dissertation, he tried to codify and describe the how and why uh, the World Wide Web was successful. Um, and he had lots of years of experience at that point to kind of draw some conclusions and kind of see the broken parts at that point. And that's what happened in 1.0. He sort of described all that. Um, and then by 1.1, you know, a lot of the problems with uh, HTTP implementations in 1.0 and the web were, were kind of fixed as a result of his restful descriptions. So he's actually a pretty neat, neat dude. Um, the, the, the key parts about RESTful, sorry, I'm just creating a little pile here, it's a mess, but uh, the key part of RESTful for API designers, so RESTful is the way that the World Wide Web works, the web pages and browsers and all that, and uh, it makes a lot of sense and it describes all that. So the, the idea behind emulating that from an API perspective is that it's a proven successful technology. These are native methods to the web. If you have a web API, you should use those native methods. You should uh, adopt the, the, the reasons and the whys and the hows that uh, internet sort of web pages work and are successful. So for API designers, the important part of RESTful from Fielding's dissertation are that we have very, very short sessions. Clients and servers really don't know much about each other than uh, a brief handshake that they do uh, over a very short period of time. Um, the building blocks of APIs are these, uh, this idea of resources, and those resources are not resources themselves, but representations of those resources, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Clients, uh, clients who consume uh, APIs uh, through REST, RESTful clients, uh, keep application state, basically. And, the, and then servers tell those clients what they can do. Uh, and that process is called hideous, which is a mouthful, which we'll also look at in more detail. And the final thing, which we will look at uh, a bit more in detail, uh, is that clients manipulate uh, resources. So clients have a resource. The server sends the client the resource. The, the client may want to manipulate that resource. And it does so by sending a representation of that resource across the web using methods that are native to the web, HTTP methods. So we'll talk a bit about that as well. So. And why am I doing this? Well, because if you were able to hold these principles in mind, these restful ideas in mind, um, basically they can guide your design decisions. Every domain out there might be different from another, and so the exact specific details of what you should do or what you shouldn't do, it might be dictated by your uh, content types, your media types. You may have specific uh, domain-specific content types that don't, don't really allow for additional things. So. Um, I could go into all of those and we'd be here for two hours or three or four, or maybe a couple days. I don't know. But the point is um, that if you can hold these principles in mind, they can sort of be guideposts to you and uh, basically prevent you from becoming, you know, all Star Trek, which is uh, going where uh, no man has gone before um, with your API design, which would be a wrongful headed thing because it can basically inform you whether or not you're relying on well-known and proven native technologies versus going cowboy and inventing your own thing, which is going to be a mistake here. So I have just a brief edit of Restful Gata De Vida. We'll not play the 80-minute song for you, but, uh, but just a small portion of it to kind of get a few of these concepts through uh, that uh, API the Design the Band tackled. This is Restful Gata DeVita. Representational state transfer, that's what REST means to me. The client keeps application state and the server gives transition possibilities. Some people call that hideous, I just call it great. RESTful clients manipulate resources by sending representations of state. What made the web so great? Series four properties and nine constraints. Restful. At least that's what Fielding said in his doctoral degree. And I think we can trust Fielding. He wrote the HTTP RFCs. Property one. There's a low barrier of entry. The web succeeded because it was easy. I like Telnet or Gopher. Property two, extensibility. 
The web could change for new requirements. It wasn't stuck where it was in its original limitations. And here's where the first edit takes place. So I cut a guitar solo and a couple properties because they're not, you know, they are relevant, but not as much, and uh, it's 80 minutes. So there's a killer summation of all of this stuff, however, in Admonson's book, Restful Web APIs, and it's one of the appendixes, and it sums up the entirety of Restful Gata De Vida in, an, in a beautiful way. Representational state transfer, that's what rest means to me. Client keeps application state and the server gives transition possibilities. Some people call that hadios, I just call it great. Restful clients manipulate resources, sending representations of state. What made the web so great? Restful. Series of four properties and nine constraints. Restful. At least that's what Fielding said in his doctoral degree. I think we can't trust Fielding. He wrote the HTTP RFC. Constraint number one. The identification of resources, where every resource gets its own URI. I'm talking about the properties of addressability. Constraint number two, the manipulation of resources through representations. We talked about this briefly, but clients and servers exchange resources by sending them complete or partial representations of the resource along via native methods. Constraint number three, self-descriptive messages, where standard methods and media types are used to indicate application semantics and a stateless series of transactions that contain all the information that a server and client need to know about the current or desired state of a resource. Strain number four, Hadios. That's hypermedia as the engine of application state. This one's a mouse, mouthful. I couldn't even say mouthful. That's how much of a mouthful it was. Uh, we're going to come back to it later, but briefly, hypermedia controls like links uh, help applications control and manage which methods and uh, HTTP in this case uh, that, that are used to manipulate resources. And here we've cut down an orchestral breakdown, a poetic reading by Morgan Freeman of various portions of the Fielding dissertation. Don't worry if it all flew by. We'll touch on the important parts later. And that's the edit, the single, if you will, of Restful Gata De Vida. Thank you very much. Okay. Man, that's a long one. Even, even the single is, uh, is sort of long. So I want to touch on three parts of this. I want, to, I want to take a look at resources in more depth. I want to look at hypermedia hadios because that's a confusing concept from an API perspective. Uh, and I want to look at HTT methods a little bit more closely. So each of these things are going to fill out our, um, our understanding of what REST is and how it applies to APIs. And of course, this was tackled. <laughs> In Resource Calling, the uh, seminal punk record from API Design, uh, where they sort of talk about resources in a little bit more depth. So let's take a listen. Represent, represent the resource at its own URL. A resource can be anything, like a book or a Taco Bell. Clients don't care if it's a man or a station, because all they ever get to see is a resource representation. You got your resource, don't worry about the rest. They're not the resources, the things that represent them in state. Representing resources in state. Rest is representing resources in state. Each resource has a media type. It could be XML, YAML, or JSON. 
And then there's extensions that add on capabilities and formats. I tell clients it's about functionality and presentation. Adds things like links and relations. But the client's still on the gets to see that resource representation. Not the resources, but things that represent them in state. Representing resources in state. Rest is representing resources in state. Oh, very rough. Thank you. Thank you. The main idea being that. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, the main idea being that uh, resources are individually addressable. That usually means they're at a URL, a canonical URL. They take uh, content types or media types. They're um, different ways to express the same thing. But the idea is that um, they might be JSON formats or YAML formats or XML formats. And inside of those resources are a series of attributes that describe the, the resource. And when I say resource, I'm using the shorthand. What I mean are representations of that resource. So that representation has all these attributes to describe that resource. That could be a full description of the entire resource, every attribute ever, ever restored about this thing or ever in some way representing it. Or it could be just a partial representation of that resource. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. And, oh, and, and the idea that it also could be anything. It can be a book, it can be a person, it can be a store, it can be a shoe, it can be anything you can think of. It can be a resource. It could be a data f database field, it could be a configuration. Um, these are all resources, and these are the building blocks of APIs. If you do any sort of any exploration of resources on the web, so go if you go to any of the APIs that we listed in the very first song, um, where we had um, you know GitHub, Facebook, Amazon, you'll start to see that the sort of lingua franca of the web and resources is JSON. Uh, this happened to win over an earlier format, which is XML and SOAP. Um, for web APIs. Uh, part of that, and that's a long story, and maybe it's not over yet, but for the moment, it does seem like JSON is the sort of the winner of this, of this comp contest. And they offer different things. But the reason JSON seems to be so successful, it's ubiquitous. It's all over the web, right? It's, it's, it's in your web browser. Um, it's, it's actually a pretty powerful format. It's small. Um, and, but it is very useful to describe all sorts of things, and that's what you need for resources, because we just said you know, they can be anything. So if they can be anything, you need something that's pretty flexible, pretty simple, to be able to get into that and describe those things with uh, relative ease. Problem with plain JSON is that the native format of, of JSON doesn't have an idea of hypermedia. There aren't links. So. It's a world without hypermedia. And, and we have, I've put this down here at the bottom. This comes from uh, GitHub. And uh, what is that? What, what is that in JSON? Is that, is, I mean, when you look at it, what does it look like? Anybody? It does look like a link. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> but, uh, it, uh, but it isn't a link. It's, uh, it's actually just a string. Um, there's nothing, you and I, by looking at it as programmers, we might consume this API and say, oh, this is clearly a link. In fact, the title, the attribute name of this is, uh, says it's a URL. I'm going to use it like a URL. I'm going to go to it and I'm going to do something or manipulate a resource there using this URL. But a machine doesn't know that unless I tell it to. And when I tell that machine that that's a URL, I've coupled my implementation. It's not a strong, um, it's not a strong implementation anymore. It's pretty weak and fragile because as soon as they change that, um, or if someone doesn't enter in a, a URL, or it's no longer a URL, there's nothing to tell me there was a URL. It's just a string. It was always going to be a string. It's how my machine understands it, except I told it something different. And that's the kind of uh, a disempowering aspect of JSON. But we're not totally uh, out on a limb. We can actually uh, use hypermedia controls in JSON, by extending JSON formats, um, we can, oh, yeah, breakfast, Hadios, basically. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Matt. Um, <laughs> so uh, Hadios is hypermedia as the engine of application state. And that's like telling us, basically the server is telling your client, hey, here's what you can do with this resource. 
Here's what to expect when you do that with the resource. Here's the kinds of methods you need to manipulate that resource. Here's what you can't do with that resource. And that's what hypermedia really does in the context of an API. You know the word hypermedia from HTML markup, I hope, or, um, or I'm telling you now. Uh, <laughs> so it, it is what connects documents to document. Um, it allows for links and images and other embedded resources within your web pages. So that's kind of what it is in the World Wide Web for browsers. For APIs, um, the real strength of you know, hypermedia for APIs is the ability to connect resources to each other. So basically, without hypermedia uh, for resources, every resource you went to is an island, and there's no roads to get away from that. You might figure out something that looks like a path there, but it's not actually a path. It's uh, whatever you think it is. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a string, it's just not a link. But hypermedia enabled JSON formats actually allow you to go from resource to resource um, to link to them, to link. Hey, it's great. So, they, I guess the the main idea of that is if you if you don't use a hypermedia JSON format, if you just use plain JSON, as so many huge companies have chosen to do, um, what you're basically saying is, um, I you <laughs> to all of your API developers, you're going to implement some kind of client for your API. Is basically, I'm not going to you need to implement to me. And uh, every company is going to implement a different way to indicate links, it's going to have different kinds of names for those things. Every client that is coded to one of those is distinct and coupled to each of those APIs. And that seems pretty lame. And that's why we have Hadios. Hadios, which was covered in the Don't Worry Be Appy uh, album from API Design, basically is going to allow us to use the power of links to connect our resources. Let's take a listen. Hypermedia, my friend. Hadios. Come to ask of you again. Hadios. Can I do with this resource I have? What methods can I use? What kind of response can I expect? Will you show me its relationships? Hypermedia. Remember Hypermedia from the internet. It allows you to link from document to document. Well, in the world of APIs, does much the same. Connects resources and describes them in machine readable ways. Without them, every resource is an island. Can't use any library of ways to get from place to place. Hypermedium, my friend. Hadios. Come to ask of you again. Hadios. Can I, with this resource I have, Methods can I use? What kind of response can I expect? Will you show me its relationships? Hypermedia. And links are the true power of hypermedia and API. can rely on two elements that they do provide. There is a trap which gives the location of the relation to your request. And there's rail which gives you a sense of where the link leads in context. standards you can try sites like IANA or provide your own hypermedia my friend 
80 posts. Come to ask of you again. What can I do with this resource I have? Methods can I use? What kind of response can I expect? Can you show me? It's relationships, hypermedia. Hypermedia. Thank you. When we have links in, uh, in resources, um, we, they do expose these two properties, which are, are pretty key. They have the href property, which you probably recognize from you know, your A tags in HTML, uh, which leads you to uh, you know, where you're going with that link. So basically, where am I headed to? It tells the client. The rel part of that, which is another property of that link in, in an API, um, exposes the, the relationship between that link and the resource you're on. So it might be um, in the example that we saw a couple slides ago, which I won't ask you to turn to, um, uh, or you can. Uh, so <laughs> in this example, which is from the HAL spec, this is a HAL implementation of links. So it's in JSON. Um, HAL is a hypermedia-capable format. We can see here that we have a section called links. And within that links, the rels are actually the properties, the attribute names. And then we have an href, which leads to those links. So um, I think this is for books or something like that. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, and so we have the self, which is pointing to itself. And then we have, well, here's the author. And or warehouse and invoice, where, this, where is this being stored? But um, there are basically domain-specific relationships that are, that are named at I-A-N-A, -A, and then these, these slides will be up online, and I've actually pointed to that, so you can go there and check that out. Um, or you can define your own. Um, when you do define your own, you need to make sure that the world understands what you meant by that. So, um, and we'll get to that in a second, which is this idea of profiles. And profiles strengthen the power of hypermedia because Profiles then tell machines or human beings um, what all these custom either attributes or relations that you defined in your resource mean. So um, I have a bunch of attributes that I've created because I have a domain-specific problem which wasn't solved by a media type that exists. So I added these to JSON or HAL or whatever my um, content media type was. So, uh, and, and those definitions then were explained in the profiles, which could be human-readable docs. Preferably, they're machine-readable docs in a machine-readable profile format, and there's several of those, and I encourage you to go uh, out on the web and take a look. Um, I think there's th three good ones, um, but anyway, uh, profiles. So that, that's what strengthen, strengthens your, your hypermedia and really informs people what, what all of these link relations mean. Without that, people are kind of in a guessing game because no one really knows what you meant by your attribute named Nacho Props. It, it just doesn't make any sense to anybody besides you, and natural props is a stupid example. Um, you'll have much more well thought out examples, but people will still be equally confused, unfortunately. It's like a tornado down there. And so finally, so we have resources which describe you know, the representations of the data. They're all of the things that are important to us that we're exposing from our backend systems, from our platforms. Um, and then we have hypermedia, Hadios, to tell us, hey, now that I have this resource, what can I do as an API client? Can I add a resource? Can I edit this resource? Can I tell you I want to do something with it? Can I delete the resource? What are the, what are the kinds of things I can do with that? And that almost completes the picture, except that we have no way to actually do that until we add the HTTP methods. And we've got several of those which are all native to the web, which makes it restful, which is great. We've got git, post, put, patch, kind of the same, kind of not, and delete, uh, which perform sort of crud-like operations on our resources. So, yeah, but I, I actually just want to have a read API. That's fine. Not every API has to implement, implement all of these resources. And not every resource collection or, or set of resources needs to implement each of these methods equally. So I might be able to read and write to books. Uh, my API might be a, a books. And I'm, I'm working with providers of books who are going to tell me what books they have available, and they can read and write. But I don't actually want them to delete any, because even if that book is no longer published, I want to have record that at one time it was. So I'm not going to allow an API client to do that. And that's totally fine. There's, there's no need to have all of these things equally supported from your REST implementation, your REST implementation server. So, but what you must do as a server and plan for as an API designer is the providing of status codes about what happens when a client does make a request and with one of these methods. Um, 
you as a server have a responsibility to say, okay, that's cool, uh, it succeeded, you did a good job, or no, that failed, there was a problem, you didn't format this correctly, You're, we're not expecting this in this format, various things like that. So you do have the responsibility to provide those status codes back. And luckily, there's a whole series of standardized response codes that you can leverage, and you should use the standards. Don't invent your own, it's a dumb idea. Um, so, basically, we, have, we kind of have a map for the CRED things. And I say CRED-like because it isn't exactly CRED, but close enough for this talk, for the purpose of this talk. So, uh, basically, Git is kind of like a read. It's, it's a safe operation. We can go out and grab as much as we want to, get all these resources, understand what they are. Post is like a, a write. We're going to write to the system. Uh, put and patch are kind of like edits. Uh, and delete is very much, well, like a delete. So... And this was put into song by our favorite band, API Design, from their Appetite for Destruct uh, album in a song called Git Post Put Patch Delete. Git Post Put Patch Delete The main methods of HTTP if you want to read or modify your application state, use one of these methods or another in the HTTP request you made. Now there's Git. It's a little like a read. It's how the resource you do retrieve. And it's safe. That's in the RFP 2616. You can retrieve resources, but leave your app state pristine. And if everything works out with the Git request you make, you'll receive a status code of 200. OK. And there's post, which is pretty unsafe. It's how you might a resource create the representation you'd like to add. Now it's up to the server if it will do just what you ask. If everything works out, with the post that you do, you'll get a status code of 201, created or accepted 202. Get post, put patch, delete, the main methods of HTTP. If you want to read or modify your application state, use one of these methods or another in the HTTP question made. To mention two more methods that you might see if you're poking around with RESTful HTTP. There is head, which is like get with nobody. And there's options, which tells you which are the methods you can do. data resource. All the patches just in RFC. And with put, you got to send things you want to change in their entirety. Whoops. <laughs> One more time. And with put, you have to send the entire representation. But with patch, you only send things that you want to change. And if everything works out with the update you perform. You'll get a status of 200, no content, 204. And finally, delete does what you might guess. Or rather, ask the server to delete at your request. And it's not safe. It'll change your application state. And it's entirely up to your server to decide your resources fade. If everything works out and the resource is no more, you might get a response with nobody of content 204. Get post, put page, delete. The main methods of HTTP. If you want to read or modify your application state, use one of these methods or another in the HTTP request you make.
Why, thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, so all of these methods are going to allow you to manipulate those resources. As a client, uh, when you delete a resource, you send a partial representation of that resource or a full representation, whatever is required by the uh, server, and it's going to tell you what is required with the status codes uh, or your profile or your human readable docs. Uh, and when you send that method, um, it's going to ask the server, hey, delete this. If the server wants to do that because you have the authorizations, then um, basically it will do that and will tell you that it has done that through a status code. Same for the rest of the methods. So it's the way that uh, resources are manipulated uh, with REST. Okay, which brings us to the power. Finally, now we have all these ideas in our head about rest, what RESTful means, which brings us to the power of API design. A basic process for this is very, very easy, um, which is to kind of two, two things. And this is, again, um, from the RESTful Web APIs book from Mike Edmondson, which is a wonderful book. I encourage you to read it if you want to know more on this subject. What he states, and what I think is a great idea, uh, is really uh, is a basic process. What you're doing is selecting a content type, a media type, which is going to be you know, I would recommend uh, a hypermedia supporting JSON content type. That, that's my experience, and that's what I like. So perhaps HAL, um, perhaps Siren, perhaps JSON LD. And it, it, there's a lot of uh, different options. You want to choose the right one for you. There may be a me uh, domain specific media type for you, and that would be the right choice. So you do need to take some time, spend some time to look into that. But uh, basically, you're going to choose a media type, and then you're going to come up with all the attributes you need, whatever isn't supplied by your media type and you're going to name those attributes. You're going to name the hypermedia link relations between your resources so that computers, uh, computer users, basically computer clients, have a way to understand how these resources are related to each other. Uh, and then you're, you're done. That's the basic process. Now, obviously, this can get a little bit more complex, um, so we'll, we'll talk about that um, for a few minutes. Um, I do want to leave time for questions. But um, go ahead. So, oh, that's good. So the early stages, uh, obviously you can't build something if you don't know what you're building. Do uh, understand from your business clients what it is they want to accomplish with the API, what part of your back end you want to expose. Um, I hope this is a collaborative effort with you and your business team or your business team is really bright and they're just gonna tell you what to do. But um, uh, e either way, you have to understand what, what it is you're building. As an API designer, you should be really familiar with the data you have in your systems. So that may mean drawing an entity relationship diagram. That may mean looking at the database tables. That may mean looking at your content types and understanding what is being recorded in your systems that you have. Say, if Drupal is your back end here, you want to look at the content types, decide what those fields are, what, kind, what types of fields are they, what are their names, have all that at your hand be able to understand what that is so that when you are creating these resources and naming them custom things, uh, you are drawing from the information that you do have and the relationships that are established in the systems that you're using. One thing I'm going to caution you on, though, is don't take a database field and make that a property on your resource. Don't take a, a field from Drupal and make that a property on your resource. That would be tightly coupling the implementation. If you move to Drupal 8, for instance, uh, and fields just aren't named the way they're named anymore, you've tightly coupled that, and now you have to figure out a new way or break your API or release a new version. And as I mentioned before, you really do have one good go. You can release new clients, but you're going to have to figure out how to phase out support for those clients over time. So, The next process uh, that you go through in API design is sort of reconciliation, and that's like you've spent time leveraging the uh, efforts, and the, the people hours of other people, experts in your field, who have taken um, all <laughs> many, many years uh, to name data in your field. Uh, there may be specific uh, implementations of that, like media types that are specific for your domain, like mapping, um, or there may be things on schema.org where people have taken time to name, say, you're a television show or a media show. There might be specific relations between shows like producers, technical directors, and named in a very specific way. If you use something like from schema.org or any of the other expertise organizations out there that have named data and have gone through um, you know, a vetting process for that, you're going to have a stronger implementation because it will be shared with you and maybe a few others, and maybe quite a few others, uh, and that's going to make it a, a reusable space. So if someone can read, a, because you've used schema.org's uh, definition podcast, maybe another podcast consuming client can just go to your API and start consuming without having to write any custom client code. And that's really the power of the standardization. That's why we go through this process of reconciliation and figuring out can we use anything that is a standard out there.
And so if you haven't come to choose a media type at, by this point in the design process, um, it is time to choose. And my recommendation for you out there, based on my experience, is that if you have a read-only system out there, go ahead and use How. I think it's very useful for this. Um, there are implementations that are ready to go-ish uh, in Drupal modules out there. They may need a little work, and we're working on that, and we'll get that out there, and it's fine. But, uh, but a lot of it, the work is done for you in these spaces, and so um, I do recommend How as a read-only, hypermedia, content-aware, JSON type. Um, if you have to do read and writes, not that you can't do that with how um, or HTML or anything like that, but um, you do need to understand that uh, the hypermedia support for other operations outside of read for how is pretty weak. Um, it's there. You, you can obviously support posts, puts, patch, edits. We're doing it in one of our projects, but um, it's, it's not as strong. So that's going to have to come down to human readable documentation or profiles. It won't be there from the resource itself. So. And then sort of the final steps, make sure everything is documented, make sure all your attributes are documented, make sure all your relationships are documented between resources. Um, this could be human readable, it could be machine readable, and I think we've made a good case for why it should be machine readable. Um, and then you wanna make sure that's published. Um, you wanna write code samples, the more code samples, write three, and you've got a very solid API. Write two, it's okay, write one, there's gonna be problems. So. If you can, if you do have the time, if you're afforded the time to write clients against your API as examples and documentation, please do that. Uh, and then finally, if there are any authorization instructions for getting an account and being able to write and read, you wanna make sure that's clear to everybody else and then you can release your API. Uh, and so, this is how it is. Hypermedia content type and document your inputs in your profile. <laughs> the final song, yeah. Thank you very much. We have about nine minutes for questions and not a lot of time, so I appreciate your uh, patience. And this is a first for me, so <laughs> I hope it was okay to do kind of a schoolhouse rock uh, musical presentation on coding. Um, pretty, pretty interesting thing for me to uh, do, and I hope it was interesting for you. So thank you all for being a great audience. Thank you so much. Um, could you go back up one? So, yeah, okay, I do, I do wanna say though, um, if you wouldn't mind filling out a survey, I'll take all your feedback on this. I know there's a ton of information that I sort of spit out in a very fast method, and so I'd like to figure out how to make this uh, a more valuable presentation for people, but still have a bit of fun. So I'll, any feedback you have, please um, go here and let me know. Uh, <laughs> now where's the free bird too? <laughs> you gotta play free bird. All right. Uh, do, but uh, do we have any questions about API design? No, we'll say this. The, if you have any in-depth questions about implementation in Drupal uh, headless sites or anything like that, I'm happy to talk to you about that. Find anybody in a green shirt and a, in a green for kitchens jacket, and they will point you my way. I'll be out on the trade floor uh, today and tomorrow, um, and happy to talk about this in, in more in-depth. But uh, any questions? Ah, that, that, yeah, that was the no rest for the wicked, uh, yeah. The album from API Design, of course. <laughs> yes. Um, you can well, uh, you can implement the options header, which might. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the question was uh, that, I, that I had said earlier that we don't have to support all the HTTP methods uh, on each resource, um, and is there, are there any standards around providing information about that? Is that, is that right? Did I get that right? <laughs> I'm sorry. To tell the client that we don't support it, yeah. Uh, okay, um, if you have used uh, hypermedia uh, aware uh, like Siren or something like that, you can actually tell the client on the resource itself what methods you do support. So you can say, you can do a put here, you can do a post, but you can't do a delete. Um, if you don't, another option is the options header, which uh, if, you, you, if you support the options header on your resource, it will basically tell clients what are the available methods on this resource. And if they're not there, they're not supported. If neither of those is an option, Clients will sometimes just go ahead and try to do stuff. 
And then you're going to send back status saying, this operation is not allowed on this resource. We don't support the CHTTP method. So there, there are alternatives there. And that would be kind of like a last step if you, if you didn't have the hypermedia support in your resource. Yes? Wow, I actually don't know about that. I, I would like to talk to you about that afterwards. Uh, and that was about Swagger, is that right? Fascinating. I, I actually don't, I, but I will form one as soon as I figure out what it is. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, I'll look into it. Thank you. Andrew. Man, what would be an example of a custom HTTP? Uh, what would be an example of that? Oh, really? Okay, interesting. Wow, I, I'm not sure if that. I'm not sure if I feel that's very restful, but like, <laughs> but, but yeah, but um, I guess definitely it's going to be in the profile, I suppose. I think you know, general advice is to sort of avoid custom HTTP methods. So if you can at all avoid it. That would be the right thing. But sometimes, sometimes you're right, though. Like, the CRUD methods just don't fit the case, uh, and then you have to do something weird. And that's why maybe we get into the space where things are restful and not rest pure. So um, my own opinion, and this is all my opinion, it's like put it in options, say it's available, um, uh, document it from your resource, from your API home, like where to go. Um, document it. If you have a hypermedia-aware uh, content type, indicate what it does there, document the relation uh, for the, if there's a cache resource, document that relation in the profile. I think that would be what I would say. Does that make sense? What, what, what do you think? <laughs> Then you can use delete or, or edit or whatever you want to, yeah, exactly. So maybe that's the solution. Just it basically, if, if it's not in the if it's not a resource into your API, your clients aren't going to see it. So you can get into trouble if you haven't resourced your resources, I guess. And, and then you end up doing maybe weird things and like, well, I don't know how to do this because we don't really have it. Well, if you don't have it, you don't have it. So if that makes any sense, I'm not sure it did. Yes. <laughs> Automated generated documentation. Um, let's see. We, I guess in, in my experience we've done, we have not, we have not. I, I think it, it would likely be possible. In some ways, you should, RESTful APIs don't need any documentation. You should have everything you need if it's hypermedia aware. Um, you know where to go, you know what the relationships are, the attributes describe themselves, they link to a profile if there's any additional custom attributes or relationships in there which are understandable. So, um, and that, I guess that, that would be the, the documentation. But you might not even need that if everything was sort of clear enough or you used standard um, relations or you had a standard content type that sort of had all that described. So you wouldn't have to provide any additional you know, documentation. So yes and no, <laughs> you know. Uh, I've certainly done enough documentation by hand that, to say that that's probably the way that I've, I've done it thus far. Yes? I think there's a there's a case for either depending on your application what you want. You could make a relation out to the, to the the image, and if that if like you're a photo app or you're a photo API, that makes a ton of sense. So you're relating images in a photo uh, album, or they're tagged, and you're you're going to all tags the family, and there's that's the relationship for those images, and you're linking directly to a photo album, or you're linking directly to an image uh, from an image that has some relation. So there'd be good reason to break that out into hypermedia links. There would, yeah, I think that's probably the strongest answer. Yeah, to go ahead and do that. Yeah, uh, if not, then you're tightly coupling what what's going to happen, right? So, and then that's like less desirable. Um, any last quick questions? I'm happy to uh, answer stuff in the hall. I don't want to hold up everybody here. We've got one minute. I totally burn out the next guy. So, thank you all so much. Uh, really appreciate it. you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. I'll see you on the trade floor. Cheers. <laughs>